Hi, everyone. Good afternoon or good morning, wherever you are in the world. And please know that we welcome you here to the Converge Virtual Forum on COVID-19 Working Groups for Public Health and Social Sciences Research. My name is Lori Peek and I serve as the principal investigator for the Converge initiative here at the Natural Hazard Center at the University of Colorado Boulder. And before we proceed today, I just wanted to acknowledge the profound disruption and loss that is occurring all around us. I know that there has been no life that's not been upended in some kind of way and this pandemic continues to inch ever closer to the inner core of our lives. And so I just wanted to say welcome to all of you. Thank you for taking the time to be here today. And thank you for the inspiring work that you are all doing. One of the things we say at the Hazard Center is we're gonna do what we can do with what we have now. And thank you for all that you are doing right now in response to this global crisis. We also wanted to send a special word of thanks to the National Science Foundation, which has made all of these efforts possible. And we also wanted to give special thanks to an anonymous donor that gave a philanthropic gift that has made the funding for the COVID-19 working groups possible. And then I also want to give special thanks to every member of the Natural Hazard Center and Converge team. They have been working around the clock on a variety of initiatives, and I am so thankful for all of them and everything that they have been doing. A few announcements before we proceed with today's virtual forum. So first, we did want to make sure that everybody knows that this virtual forum is being recorded and that we will post the recording as well as the slides on the Converge website for this particular virtual forum. Please do ensure that your microphones remain muted throughout the course of the virtual forum in order to cut down on background noise, including barking dogs, which I know I have one in the background. A few other announcements and resources we wanted to share include that to please visit the Natural Hazard Center website where Jolie Breeden and other members of the team are curating a number of resources on COVID-19 that we hope can be of service to the broader research and practice community. We also are very excited to announce to all of you today that we have now launched in partnership with several regional, national, and international organizations, a COVID-19 global research registry for public health and social sciences. This is a registry where if you have an ongoing study on COVID-19, we would like to invite you to please go to converge.colorado.edu to our website and to take about 10 minutes to register your study. And this is so we can highlight novel public health and social science research that's been initiated in response to this pandemic to expand opportunities for research collaboration and to try to reduce duplication of effort to identify unmet research needs and also to create possibilities to share and publish research instruments, data collection and ethics protocols and data. We also hope that when taken as a whole that this registry will help to further set a comprehensive social science research agenda. I'm also very pleased to share that in addition to this registry being available in the English language, it's also currently available in French Mandarin, Chinese, and Spanish. And that is because we are very fortunate to have Hazard Center team members who speak these languages and have already done the cross translation of the website and the, the registry form. And we're always welcome, welcoming additional collaborations and contributions. There are others out there who may want to support this effort. We do, again, hope that you will uh, share your study in this registry. 
Uh, Jennifer Tobin, who is the Deputy Administrator at the Natural Hazard Center and who many of you heard from on the last virtual forum related to COVID-19, where she shared an overview of the center's longstanding quick response program, is now going to do a brief update on where we're at with the applications received. Jennifer. Hi, everyone. Um, I am excited to announce that on March 16th, uh, the Natural Hazards Center released a special call for proposals to fund uh, research that examines how COVID-19 is affecting potentially vulnerable or marginalized populations, healthcare workers, and other frontline responders, various organizations, and communities. That special call closed on April 1st, and we have now received 56 research proposals. Uh, we will be able to award approximately 15 of those projects for up to $3,000 each. Um, the submitted proposals are under blind peer review now, and the final determinations will be made by April 16th, so I'm very excited to uh, read those. And abstracts of each of these funded proposals will be posted on our website at hazards.colorado.edu, uh, back or forward slash research, forward slash quick response report, forward slash funded, so you'll be able to read about those projects as they're ongoing. Thank you. Nice. Thank you, Jennifer, and I know you have fielded an unbelievable number of emails over the last couple of weeks and we were just so excited to um, see all the increase coming in and now I know you have all the proposals in front of you so for those of you on the forum who submitted thank you so much for submitting the proposals and thanks to the NSF for the ongoing support of this quick response program which has planted the seeds for so many uh, uh, important studies in this field. So thank you again, Jennifer, for all of your uh, tremendous leadership with this. So now the, the uh, main purpose of our virtual forum today is to share information regarding the call for COVID-19 working groups. And so I'm gonna spend just a couple of minutes going over the, um, the guidelines for these working groups and responding to some of the questions that we've been receiving about them just so we're all on the same page. And then we're going to get to hear from a number of researchers who are interested in forming and leading uh, some of these COVID-19 working groups. And I know there are many other ideas out there that we'll hopefully hear about today as well. So first, if you go to our converge.colorado.edu website and click on the resources tab, you will see a box there that says COVID-19. And there are a number of resources in that box. And one of them is the link to the COVID-19 Working Groups for Public Health and Social Sciences Research page. And I wanted to pause to really acknowledge, in addition to all the members of the team here who spent time reviewing and getting these materials ready, Kathleen Tierney, Robert Soden, and Laura Stow all gave extensive feedback on the initial ideas for these working groups, and we just really wanted to acknowledge them and, and thank them for that feedback. So these working groups are really all about trying to draw together researchers who are working on common areas of in interest, who are working on methodological advancements in response to COVID-19, and um, who are doing other, other novel things where their efforts might be amplified through joining together. And so a few of the application requirements that we wanted to highlight with this. Number one, that the COVID-19 working group should have a clear focus area. And you're going to hear a number of example uh, uh, working group ideas today. And I think they, um, we, you will see that they're illustrative of sort of drawing together a clear focus area within the social sciences and public health where researchers can band together to again amplify their efforts. So clear focus area. Second requirement, the working groups must be led by someone who is a public health researcher or a researcher in the social behavioral and economic sciences and preference will be given to those who are members of the Social Science Extreme Events Research Network, which is our NSF-funded coordinating work, work uh, network for the social sciences. Now, 
members of the teams can come from any disciplinary background. And in fact, diverse teams with diverse disciplinary backgrounds are strongly encouraged. And we do ask that the teams all involve team members with up to three disciplines. And again, can come from any discipline within the social sciences or from other fields such as engineering, the life sciences and the humanities, for example. This is because we're trying to promote deep transdisciplinary convergence oriented research. Preference will also be given to teams that are able to show and demonstrate that they have, um, that they're either led by or have deep integration of students, members of historically underrepresented groups, and have otherwise thought about diversity in the context of forming the working group. Also in the application form, and you will hear some of this today from the group's information and otherwise, is that groups must indicate one of three categories. It's either a group that is in formation and actively recruiting members. It's either what we're calling an open working group, meaning that the core working group has either been formed. These may, as you're gonna hear today, be working groups that have been in place for a very long time, but they've shifted some of their efforts to focus on COVID-19. Or they may be working groups that have formed just in the time since the, um, since, since the virus began to spread and are, are forming together around that uh, topical, uh, topical area related to the pandemic. Also, there are closed working groups where the working group is already formed and they are not accepting additional collaborators. And any three of those will be eligible and there's no preference for any one of the three. And then finally, you're just asked to write a brief budget justification the working groups that are funded will each receive a thousand dollars to support the research any research related expense that you should so choose and there are no stipulations around that so we hope you will think creatively about how your group may use that funding the delivery requirement for the working groups is that we're going to ask the working groups will be identified by mid-April. So the application deadline closes on April 13th and we will identify the working groups by April 17th and we'll notify all applicants. The one delivery requirement is that about two months after the working groups have been funded and hopefully fully formed, we're gonna ask each of the working groups to deliver a one to two page research agenda setting paper that's due on June 19th, 2020, which I'll tell all of you that happens to be my birthday. And so I guess that tells you what kind of birthday present I'm looking for, which is the greatest gift from this research community. We're excited to hear about the key ethical, methodological, or empirical gaps that your group has identified and that you think warrant further investigation in response to this global crisis. And so we are very much looking forward to learning from these working groups. That final research agenda setting paper will be published on the Converge website. And so it will be made publicly available and that is the only deliverable that we're asking for from these working groups because we know that each of the working groups are going to take a different form. They will um, engage in different ways with one another and so forth. And so we don't want to put other parameters around these working groups because some of the magic is obviously just going to occur from that process of coming together and creating your own process for knowledge production. Now, we're going to turn to a number of researchers who reached out to us at Converge with ideas for working groups. So last Saturday, for those of you who actually read the letters that I send out to all of you, uh, Jen and I sent out a letter to uh, the SCR network and to other persons who've subscribed to updates through the Converge website announcing that we were gonna be funding up to 30 of these COVID-19 working groups, and then inviting persons who had ideas for working groups to reach out to us and to let us know if they wanted to be put on the agenda for today. And as usual, this extraordinary community stepped up and we have received already a number of fantastic ideas for working groups. And we're getting ready to hear from the working group leads for a variety of topics. 
but I do want to make clear to everybody on the call, because Jennifer looked at the slides before this, and she said, Lori, you have to make this clear. So some they, these working groups, you're going to see that they're either are um, marked as they're open, they're already formed and they're open for new members or they're closed and not open to members or they're in formation and actively recorded recruiting. And so what I wanted to say is none of these working groups have yet been funded. So they haven't been funded yet. The application deadline doesn't even technically open until tomorrow. And so these working groups have not been funded yet. But as you're going to hear from the researchers, again, many of them have already formed together. Others are in early stages of formation. But we just want to make clear, nobody's been funded yet. And these are the groups that are presenting that had reached out to us and had asked to be added to the agenda. We know that there are others who are likely on the forum today who may have additional working group ideas. So once we get through the people who've been asked to be added to the agenda, all the remaining time will be dedicated to um, any other open suggestions or ideas and sharing from those of you on the forum. So thank you for listening to that overview. Thank you again for being here today. And now we're gonna proceed what we did, we sort of, uh, based on the, the ideas that we've received so far, we ended up just grouping these into sort of three categories that you're gonna hear for, about today. So first we're gonna hear from um, um, about 10 groups that we just sort of lumped under the umbrella of empirical considerations. Then we're gonna pause for a minute so that people can have a chance to sort of get on the chat and, and respond to the ideas they've just heard. Then we're going to transition and we're going to hear working groups ideas in the methodological and ethical and research network formation area. And then finally, we're going to hear a set of working group ideas related to uh, population groups and related to um, other um, issues around potentially vulnerable populations. So we're going to start off with empirical considerations. And Lauren Clay is gonna be first up and everybody's microphones again should be muted, but now you can sort of see yourself in the order. So when I call on you, go ahead and please unmute. All of the working group leads have about one and a half minutes to share whatever they wanna share about the working group. And so Lauren, over to you. Thanks so much, Lori. Um, so my recently formed and open um, working group is titled COVID-19 and Food Access Availability and Security. And it really grew out of a study over the last two years looking at the influence of uh, Hurricane Florence in North Carolina on the local food environment. And um, what we really observed were, um, a few, well, lots of things, but one that there aren't great tools for assessing the food environment after a disaster disruption. Um, we went from hearing in an interview in the morning, I just can't get any food, to doing an assessment in the morning and seeing food in the store. Um, so really trying to understand the discrepancy between food availability, utilization, and then disparities that are arising in different groups. Um, and so fast forward to coronavirus, and now food has become a key issue in this event. Um, we don't really have a toolbox that we're all operating with together. Um, so the aims of this working group are to catalyze the, uh, the moment with this event to um, put together a group that will share information, um, instruments across studies, research sites, and disciplines, uh, provide an opportunity to align on measures so that we can look across time, space, place, and populations at the issues that are related to food, um, it'll be a space to develop partnerships around analyses to do that work. Uh, and finally, um, to develop, identify, validate a set of baseline food environment assessments that we can mobilize across disaster events. Uh, so as I mentioned, we're formed but open. We already have a growing interdisciplinary team, public health, uh, applied economics, disaster science, ecology. Um, and we actually already have a data collection instrument repository that is up and running and growing. Uh, it will soon include um, a broader set of social determinants of health in addition to food. Um, so if you are um, energized about the aims of this work group, if you have a disciplinary perspective that you'd like to contribute, or if you have any experience with evaluating and validating metrics, uh, please reach out. 
Thank you, Lauren. And I know that Carla Brasotto is on the call and she has expressed an interest in food security issues, comparative study across China, Italy, and US. So looking forward to uh, you two continuing to connect and others on here. So thank you, Lauren. Uh, next up, Daniel Aldrich could not be with us this evening because of the Shabbat. And I uh, apologize to our Jewish friends and colleagues for the timing of this, but I, I believe his colleague, Tim, is on the line to share about the next working group idea. Thanks so much. Hi, this is Tim Fraser from Daniel Aldrich's team at Northeastern University. Um, we're excited to be starting up a working group um, on social ties, mobility, and the spread of COVID-19. Um, we've already started to see some preliminary evidence that uh, communities that are uh, more networked, um, that, that have stronger bridging and linking ties um, with their local officials, seem to be adopting social distancing or physical distancing, as we like to call it, um, better than those with, with weaker bridging and linking ties. We also um, are, are seeing that certain communities um, are, are still uh, meeting together in groups, and, and these uh, communities might have weaker bridging ties. They may not be getting the information uh, that lets them know that they probably shouldn't be doing that at this time. Um, and they're seeing spikes in um, they're they're seeing spikes in uh, COVID nineteen rates. And so we want to conduct a natural experiment um, using neighborhoods, um, some of which have strong social capital, some of which have weak social capital. Um, to see what the effect of this is on COVID-19 um, related behaviors like adopting physical distancing um, and whether or not they're um, uh, getting COVID-19. Uh, so we're planning on starting a postcard survey uh, where we're hoping to send uh, about uh, a thousand postcards to one neighborhood with weak social capital, um, a thousand postcards to one uh, with strong social capital so that we can compare these differences. And we're hoping to repeat this experiment across several different uh, communities. Uh, we're starting out with Boston because that's where we're based, um, but we're excited to scale this up and move on to New York and to Seattle and San Francisco. Uh, if anyone is interested in joining in, we're happy to have you. Um, and we're excited to see what we can do together. So thanks so much. Thank you, Tim, so much. Um, next, we're going to hear from Robert Soden. Thanks, Lori. Yeah, hi, everyone. Um, my name is Robert Soden, and I'm a postdoc at, at Columbia University in New York. And I'm currently working with a number of folks to, to form a new working group um, around the emergent and hyperlocal community response to, to the coronavirus. So around the country right now, there are um, hundreds, if not thousands, of local mutual aid groups that are either forming or, or recalibrating prior work. Uh, to provide um, share information, provide material or, or emotional support um, to to their neighbors, um, and this is you know obviously connected to a very well known phenomena um, related to community self help during disaster and community organizing in the United States more generally. Um, but there's 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 a number of reasons why why the particulars of this coronavirus epidemic, as well as our kind of current historical moment. Um, makes this sort of mobilizing look, look significantly different than, than in prior disasters. Um, so my, my research questions in this work uh, really relate to sort of the use of, I work in crisis informatics, so very interested in, in how the communication technologies are, are enabling and shaping the work of these groups. I'm also very interested in, in kind of the discursive framing, how these groups are, are understanding this disaster and, and responding to it as, as opposed to, or, or as distinct from um, the government and, and formal organizational response. So we're recruiting um, an interdisciplinary group of scholars uh, who are interested in studying these questions, but as well as well their own questions that they could bring to this, the, this topic. Um, and we're really looking to uh, share relevant data and information with each other, provide peer feedback as we start to develop our, our research uh, questions and, and plans, um, and really provide our own forms of mutual aid to each other as we as we try to determine how to stay on top of this complicated and, and quickly changing situation, uh, determine what the relevant research questions are and how to study them. Um, so we're, again, we're actively recruiting and my email is robert.soden at columbia.edu. So please get in touch. Thank you, Robert. 
And next, we're going to hear from a match that has already been made in the process of putting out this call for working groups. So Vanessa and Fallon. Thank you, Lori. Um, as you see here, I'm Vanessa Leon, and along with my colleague Fallon Adu, we are the co-leads for the working group on economic resilience of commercial corridors in majority minority communities. And Fallon will give us a little more about our working uh, description and aim. Oops, sorry. Thank you all. Um, <clears throat> we research commercial revitalization and resilience post-disaster, and we're adapting our research, our ongoing research of minority serving commercial corridors in New Orleans and New York to assess how these COVID epicenters are going to weather these crises. Um, we envision this working group will do at least the following, not exclusively this, um, cultivate longitudinal study of commercial corridors that largely serve um, and or employ people of color, develop indices and indicators of economic distress and resilience in immigrant and uh, ethnic enclaves, especially since this is where most businesses are small and minority owned. We wanna illustrate with mixed methods in particular, what it means for majority minority communities to be back in business, so to speak, and to illuminate the financial and social systems that uh, support commercial revitalization and recovery in these communities. And already has been mentioned as mutual aid, but also philanthropic relief funds and other government sources. From our perspective, a mixture of research methods and explanatory models are critical to understanding COVID's impact on the commercial anchors of historically marginalized communities of color. So we represent the interdisciplinary social science of urban planning, but we welcome researchers to bring their disciplinary expertise and tools to bear on the study of business closure and displacement, tenant turnover and retention, Main Street vacancy and vitality. Uh, most of all, we're interested in expanding the repertoire of research methodologically and empirically, um, and we invite collaborators to share their own approach to placing economic resilience in the economic, in the ecosystems of marginalized communities. Thank you, Vanessa, and thank you, Fallon, very much. And your uh, cities are on all of our minds for sure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so now we're going to just take like a, a little brief pause because everybody's seeing am I next up and so um, these are going to be our next four presenters and so uh, Patrick Roberts who is now with Rand you're going to be next up. Thank you. Great, thank you. Uh, I'm Patrick Roberts. I'm a researcher at the Rand Corporation and uh, also a professor at uh, Virginia Tech uh, and our uh, group uh, is really looking at the impact of technology on public sector work in the COVID-19 environment. Uh, and there's some obvious applications to emergency management. How do you do distancing uh, in emergency management? Um, but there are other related questions too. And I'm working with, among others, Shalini Mishra, who is a uh, psychologist at Virginia Tech, uh, and Joanne Tang, who is a graduate student who may be on this call. Hi, hi Joanne. Uh, and we begin with some pre-COVID work on digital distraction and information overload uh, in emergency management and the effect on thinking and critical thinking faculties in particular. And we wanna see what does this look like in the COVID information environment and what can we learn about how to manage information, technology, digital information under COVID conditions. Thank you very much, Patrick. Next, we're gonna hear from Elizabeth Alvarez. Hi, good evening, everyone. Um, thank you. So this is something that we're just starting uh, to put together and uh, it might follow along with what Patrick just talked about, but I'm interested in the policy perspective of um, when, especially either countries or specific states or provinces in Canada made certain decisions around policies. Um, so for example, when did they decide to close primary and secondary schools? Um, when did they close non-essential services? The use of masks? Um, when did they institute uh, working from home policies and such and so on? Um, the reason for being that complex uh, in a way is that I also want to study this within the contextual factors of that country. Uh, we know we're reading a lot about attributing, you know, mortality rates to this country or that country because their health 
health system is robust or it is not. Um, I think it's much more complex than that. And so we need a really good understanding of the context in which these policies are being made, the reasons why they're being made, what are the triggers for them being made at certain times, um, and then what actually works. Uh, and the purpose of this is to inform future pandemic um, planning. So it's open to any jurisdiction that uh, is interested in, in contributing to this. Thank you, Elizabeth. Okay. Next, we're going to hear from Jessica Pardee and Dana Green, who've joined forces for a working group. Hi. <clears throat> Hi, this is Jess. Uh, one of the things we're interested in looking at is this idea of COVID-19 as an inverted disaster. So as a Katrina New Orleanian, um, everything was different. The infrastructure was broken. In this situation, the infrastructure is intact. Water is potable, the power is running, and yet the challenge of maintaining social order is still persisting. In particular, the role of family plays an important role, not always, but uh, has a big impact on people's disaster experiences, the resiliency, the recovery. And so I'm interested, and Dana and I have been talking about ways to look at and creating a working group that's really understanding how different types of families, not just nuclear families, but also social kin families, are uh, functioning in this moment. So a heavy focus on the lived experience of being in the moment. So you have people who are um, on one hand social distancing or require isolation, while also you're having care work uh, lineages that are being kind of dismantled or reconfigured in different ways. So you have this combination of social rupture as well as kind of emotional congealing of social kin families. So you have first responders or coworkers or neighbors that are creating new families that may be more supportive for individuals than even uh, their nuclear family or their extended family networks might be. Um, even athletic teams and clubs are coming into new systems of care. And so as a support work that was once completed by familial kin is gonna be shared in different kind of identity communities. Uh, this is a formed an open working group. So we're inviting scholars who are interested in documenting the lived experience of families in all sorts of types um, as they grapple with the emergent challenges. Uh, the end goal of the working group is to produce either an edited volume or devoted journal issue. Uh, we actually have a journal, I have an edit, journal editor who has already said if I put the proposal in, he will propose, he will accept the special issue. So we're on track with that already. And inter, multi, cross, whatever word you want in front of disciplinary, no silos, uh, is encouraged. And our guiding framework methodologically is the collective method. So this is something that Lori and I have worked on in our Katrina working group, along with Alice, who's on this call, Lynn, and a whole bunch of other scholars who did Katrina work. Um, we're at each stage, both formation as well as writing drafts for what would be either that edited volume or journal issue. You would share that those early stage drafts all along the way and have a lot of input from other scholars in the group. So if you're interested in the group, you have to be also open and willing to share very, your, your little baby caribou of like ideas in very messy forms. Um, but also having that support system as we all go through this shared and very horrible experience is something that can be very beneficial to the end product and to making sure individual project projects within become as diverse as possible. This is not a group where everyone's doing one project. This is an umbrella under which each people do their individual separate work, but we all come together to make this either edited volume or special issue at the end stage. Um, and that it allows you to have sort of a support team to help you think through some of your own methodological issues or um, see the things you don't see because of all of our intersectional statuses. So if you have questions about the collective method side, I can send you the PDF of the paper that we've written, um, but that kind of covers it. But again, a focus on the lived experience of the disaster and sort of the redefinition of family throughout this process. So uh, that can be micro or macro and scale we've got so far you know, emergency management kind of angle. Um, I do a lot of stuff kind of angle, um, as well as uh, kind of thinking about sports and other types of communities and neighbors. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jessica, very much. Next, we're gonna hear from John Zellner.
Oh, John, uh, and this is for John from the University of Michigan. Are you on the webinar? I am. Can you hear me? Oh, now? there we go. Hi. Sorry, I was having yes, some kind of microphone experience. issues. Sorry about that. Thank you. Um, so my name is John Zellner. I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Epidemiology um, and the Center for Social Epidemiology and Population Health at the University of Michigan School of Public Health. Um, and so the, the title of our proposed working group is you know, focused on mitigating inequality in COVID-19 outcomes with a focus on incarceration, segregation, um, and poverty. And so the first part of this is, the incarceration part of this is part of, would be part of an ongoing project in partnership with the Cook County Correctional Facility in Chicago, um, which you may know is undergoing a large um, COVID-19 outbreak. So this is work um, that we're already doing, looking at MRSA, skin and soft tissue um, infections and transmission within the facility. So we have kind of unique access um, to, to a, a in, you know, to a, a large urban jail that has a significant burden at this point of, of COVID-19. And aside from myself, the key um, co-investigators, one is an infectious disease physician um, who were named Kyle Popovich, who works with the um, with the jails and also with the Cook County Health and um, Hospital System, and also one of the lead physicians in the Cook County Correctional Facility. Um, and so our objective here is to look at um, COVID transmission within the facilities to model that using infectious disease transmission dynamics models, um, but also to think of the impact of transmission within the facility on the community at large. Um, so, you know, there's often a popular conception that the um, that that jails and prisons are these isolated places, but in fact, they're really very porous institutions. So these are places where people are coming in and out. You know, the average stay is about 30 days. Um, so people are being arrested, brought into the facility, perhaps they're not even charged, but eventually are sent home. And obviously they're exposed to risk in the facility. And then when they leave, um, there's, there's onward risk to their families and, and communities, right? So we're seeing, you know, the, the one of, this is one of the many ways in which, um, in, you know, incarceration and mass incarceration in particular, you know, sport, spreads the burden of disease um, differentially on, on impoverished or on um, discriminated groups. So, you know, this is an area that we're, we're looking for some help in, in building out the theoretical framework and for thinking about the way to maximize the impact of this work. But we also have a very strong infrastructure for collecting these data. We'll be getting them prospectively um, as we go. So this is a project that's kind of already ongoing, but we're looking to really um, build it out and make an immediate impact on transmission within the facility and risk um, to the community at large. Um, and then as a secondary goal, as we, we go forward, we're going to be thinking about, you know, publications and other funding opportunities, but this is really part of the immediate response in the, in the present moment. And I think through that, we're going to learn uh, quite a bit. Thank you, John. Okay. And now we have uh, four more groups in this particular uh, uh, thematic area of empirical and topical working group proposals. And so giving everybody a second to find their, their name on there. And so Sarah McBride and Bob DeGroot from the US Geological Survey, you're gonna be next up whenever you're ready. Hi everyone, thank you so much, Lori and the Converge team for hosting us today. Um, I'm Sarah McBride, I'm a research social scientist with the US Geological Survey. And I, I think our group title really explains it all. What if the earth underneath our feet does something really unfortunate during this time? And we wanna understand how our systems and how our people would cope given the COVID environment we're currently working in with this added strain or pressure if or when uh, something does occur. So just quickly about our group that we've already formed. We are an open group, um, so we are looking for members if you're interested. Uh, currently, we have a mixture of researchers from anthropology, uh, from different disciplines, from anthropology to social psychology, communication and media studies, sociology, disaster and emergency management and operational research uh, and uh, public administration and public policy. Uh, we want to work across mixed methods and in some ways really 
the, sky, the size and the scope of whatever event uh, that it will occur will determine which methods will be more appropriate. Uh, so we need researchers who are really quick on their feet and, and willing to go, to go with whatever event uh, Mother Nature throws at us at this point. Um, currently, we've got a number of moderate and slightly damaging quakes that have already occurred in the time of COVID, uh, including particularly in Utah. Uh, we had an earthquake in Texas and in Idaho, and Puerto Rico also has an ongoing aftershock sequence um, that is still uh, generating some pretty uh, sizable earthquakes. So if you want to join the team, and, and I really hope you, you consider it, um, and who want to study the exciting world of geohazards with us, uh, we're looking for scholars who are both diverse in terms of disciplines, but also geographically. Um, so we already have people from New Zealand, Puerto Rico, Washington, Colorado, and California. Um, so th those areas are geographically represented. If you don't come from those areas, um, please reach out to us. Um, although even if you do, we'd still love to hear from you. Um, these, the type of disciplines we currently don't have expertise in right now is infrastructure, urban and regional planning, uh, building engineering, public health, data science, and computer science, and really creative and expressive arts. We would love to hear from our art scholars here because we know that arts are so critical in response and recovery from natural, um, from, uh, from uh, disasters that are generated from, from geohazards. Um, however, if I didn't list out any of your disciplines, please reach out anyway. Um, we want to also collaborate across not only academic institutions, but also other national geographic uh, geological surveys and government organizations like the one I work for. So thank you very much. Thank you, Sarah, and thank you for taking time for this. We know the USGS has been very busy with the pandemic and also the earthquakes you named, so thank you. Um, next, we're going to hear from Dave Hondula. Yeah, thank you, uh, Lori. Hopefully you can hear me okay. Yes, you sound great. And, uh, and thanks, to, thanks to you and the team for, for putting this uh, discussion together. Uh, we can just take what Sarah said and duplicate it, but take a below ground hazards and shift to above ground hazards. I see a question that just came in on the chat about flooding, which is perhaps a little bit of both. Uh, the, uh, what motivated us to think about putting a, a working group together uh, here in Arizona is that we've literally been in the midst of our preseason heat planning uh, as this, cr this crisis has been unfolding. And there are already questions that have emerged from some of our public sector, sector partners about how to operate various heat programs this summer, uh, given some of the restrictions uh, and re recommendations that might be in place. For example, uh, many folks here, thousands every summer rely on cooling centers, public gathering places for access to cool space. Well, public gathering places are off the table right now. And, and we could probably list out you know, five or 10 of those uh, intersections and, and conflicting issues for heat and perhaps other hazards as well. We've heard of, of uh, interesting challenges related to tornado warnings going off in the Midwest recently. Uh, it's hurricane preparedness season as well. So, so uh, our team here in Arizona would like to convene a working group to talk about these issues, these intersections and conflicts uh, do some conceptual mapping of what they are, but I'll also critically provide some guidance documents that we hope will be used in real time uh, by practitioners. For example, the CDC has a guidance document right now uh, that helps local jurisdictions set up cooling centers. It seems like that document sure could uh, benefit from an annex or appendix right now about how to operate a cooling center uh, at this time. And, and we could imagine generating one or more of those types of, uh, of annexes for guidance documents. I'm not sure if this is a conversation to focus on one weather hazard or multiple, uh, so I look forward to, to seeing what input there is from the group. Thanks again, Lori, and your team. Nice. Thank you, Dave. And um, speaking of the, the amazing team, Jennifer and Katie, as always, are helping to keep us on track. And they just messaged me that John Burton is out there, and he asked that because I can't, when I'm running the slides, I'm so sorry, everybody, but I can't see the chat. And um, so John had chatted in and said, if you're trying to message the researchers after they share, if you can try to direct message them so they don't get lost in what looks like, I think a lot of chat messages coming up. Um, so thank you, John, for that suggestion. But also please know I, if you could keep the chat 
You can also chat privately, but if you keep it in the public chat, uh, Katie and the team here will then take all the chats and we'll make sure that they get to the researchers. So please know we're trying to have resiliency through redundancy. So thank you for that suggestion. And Jen and Katie, please keep messaging me if there's something I'm missing or something somebody's suggesting to make this go better. So thank you and um, thanks again, Dave. And so now we're going to turn to Kalash Gupta, our colleague in India. Oh, Kalash, I, I think you're muted. Okay, now can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Yes. Okay, uh, I'm Dr. Kailas Gupta. I'm in Jaipur in India, at, and uh, now it is at 3.15 a.m. India time. Okay, so our group is uh, on COVID-19 and civil liberties, social control in India and the United States. And our group is uh, actually is already formed. We already have got members, so it is open. And in our group, we have uh, um, 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 from uh, Kansas State University, uh, pro um, assistant professor, associate professor, which of journalism, and we have got two students and uh, computer professional and uh, environment science and uh, disaster studies, and we are looking for other members. So, uh, and so if you are interested, you are, you are most welcome. So now I'll tell you about our uh, focus. So our working group focus will be on the comparison of curtailment of civil liberties in the aftermath of coronavirus in the US and India. And particularly of the vulnerable people like aged and social socioeconomically poor. The group will identify lessons and best practices in balancing isolation, quarantine, and lockdown policies uh, with constitutional liberties and rights. So one side, there is a problem of um, uh, lockdown, etc. Another people are fighting for civil liberties. The group will examine content analysis of policies issued by coronavirus response by state and healthcare authorities. And uh, we will also uh, conduct qualitative interviews. Um, uh, with healthcare and stakeholders. The working group will consist of transdisciplinary researchers from US, India, and other countries and students. So if you are excited about uh, what we are trying to do about uh, civil liberties and, uh, and also to contain the virus, you are most welcome to join. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you, Kalash, for getting up so early or staying up so late to be with us today. Thank you. Uh, next, we're going to hear from Ida Mamuji. Hi, everyone. Um, this is a working group uh, entitled Stigma, Fear, Discrimination, and Backlash, Social Countermeasures and Emergency Management Actions to Address Those. Um, we are definitely in formation and recruiting members. It's very preliminary. Uh, but what we do notice is a lot of researchers across the world are doing uh, research on issues of stigma and fear and discrimination. And um, we think that it would be very important for all of us to come together if we can to share what we're looking at specifically. So, for example, one aspect of stigma that's evident is that that's being uh, faced by Chinese communities um, around the world. Um, they're facing impacts to their personal well-being and livelihoods. Um, so we'd like to explore issues of stigma, um, you know, th that being faced by Chinese communities, one aspect, but also what, what is stigma once somebody contracts COVID and recovers, for example, that, that can be something else to consider. Um, so in addition to exploring those issues, we'd like to look at um, social countermeasures or emergency management actions to address the issues of stigma um, and essentially to improve community cohesion. So I'm listed right now as um, the person here that's talking in the lead, but I'm definitely, uh, this is so preliminary. I really hope that if people are interested in, in joining this group, we can come together and, and, and find who would be best place to, to lead an initiative like this. Thank you so very much. And so uh, the 12 working group ideas that you just heard, again, were just sort of generally placed under this sort of empirical and topical area. 
And now we're going to sort of pause for a moment. Moment we're going to turn where we have um, nine additional proposals that are going to be under our next organizing frame, which is ethical concerns and methodological advancements. And so I'm just trying to talk a little bit slow. So if anybody has uh, just you're trying to message out to any of the researchers who just went, please feel free to do that. And also know that, again, we'll be posting this video and we'll definitely post the slides with everybody's contact information online uh, after this forum is complete. So thank you. So next, we're going to hear from Jack Rozdilski in this particular thematic area. Jack, whenever you're ready. Oh, okay. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Peek and uh, group. Uh, greetings from Toronto, uh, Canada. I have comments for uh, about one minute, 30 seconds. The title of this proposed group is Doing the Doing of Research During COVID-19. The status of the group is formed and uh, open. Uh, to differentiate from some of the previous discussions, very interesting discussions that have been presented, this group is not intended to focus on a specific topic of inquiry, but more of the operational aspects of doing research in difficult times. The group is guided by a primary principle of doing no harm during COVID-19 research. The purposes of the group are two. One, to identify problems, document the complexities of quick response research, and consider the unintended consequences of the work that we are all doing. The second purpose of the group is to attempt to suggest workarounds and identify potential solutions to some of these problems. Uh, areas of inquiry lie under ethical concerns and advancements and methodological innovations. Uh, I have uh, taken the liberty to be the lead organizer for this group, and I've been seeking guidance from persons who have a large, uh, great experience in qualitative uh, field uh, research, including uh, Jane Henrique, an independent uh, researcher out of Washington, D.C., and uh, Joanne D. Ruin, uh, a sociologist out of the uh, University of Louisiana, Lafayette. If anyone has uh, interest in such uh, topics and cooperating, with this uh, proposed uh, group, please feel free to reach out to me. Uh, that is the conclusion of my comments. Uh, thank you and over. Thank you, Jack, very much. Next up, we're, we're going to move from Toronto to Florida. So Palab, you're next up. Hi, uh, thank you, Laurie. Yes, uh, the working group that we are thinking about is social vulnerability and system in a probability modeling group. Basically, uh, we are trying to build on from some of our ongoing work. You know, I'm a, uh, I ha we have an ongoing project on CRISP, uh, critical uh, interdependent infrastructure system and processes. Uh, so what we do in this uh, working group, basically, um, we are uh, proposing building computational social science tools to develop, you know, uh, coupled socio-infrastructural models. And our objective is to how do we optimize responses in terms of showing different pathways of recovery and resilience and so on. So that's the big picture of our uh, working group theme. And given our ongoing work, we have a good deal of uh, expertise in hurricane related coastal hazard risk. And remember, uh, we have a you know huge coastal population in the Gulf and Atlantic. And specifically being in Florida, we have a very large segment of elderly people. And yesterday we just got the, saw the news that this year Colorado State University and other organization that gives a long-term hurricane forecast and they are saying that we have a very active hurricane season coming down the line. So some of the things we are thinking about, you know, how do we prepare and respond to this kind of situation where you have this compounded risk, for example, you know, how do you organize evacuation behavior under pandemic risk? How do you comply with social distancing behavior in terms of transporting people, sheltering people, what it will look like under those kind of situations and so on. So uh, methodologically speaking, our objective is to collect social and behavioral data 
at a very granular level, business households in different uh, demographic and economic gradients, uh, for example, mobility, different age group and so on, and trying to integrate those things with the epidemiological risk modeling. We have a good uh, uh, computational epidemiology group in our uh, uh, risk project and basically we'll integrate those things to uh, map out the hotspot of social vulnerability in order to develop some coupled infrastructure, social infrastructural model and a basic uh, major focus will be the public health infrastructure in terms of hospital capacity, beds and you know, gears and other uh, you know, very critical need that emerges and how do you make some uh, reorganize these resources to better uh, expand the capacity to meet the emerging need and so on. So um, in general, you know, we are trying to uh, start from a very micro scale household business levels different types of modeling, uh, you know, ensemble types of approach, taking it to the scale it up to a regional city levels to understand the inoperability, what kind of disruption or what kind of impacts it has and how do we optimize the response to, to plan and to, to enhance the resilience and so on. And one of the things that we consider, you know, given the existing the way hospital networks or public health networks work, there are probably a good deal of efficiency you can gain uh, by resource pooling, resource sharing across different healthcare facilities and so on. So we plan to integrate different scale. So, you know, mm -hmm. from going from social and behavioral response to all the way to how do you optimize response, which one to you know, in terms of bringing the bringing online in terms of additional health facilities or additional buildings, additional resources, how can we improvise the basically system to keep it more functional and so on. One thing to remember that we are dealing with saving lives and saving livelihoods and at the same time, and how do we make the best choice in this kind of, you know, difficult situation and so on. Mm -hmm. Thank you everybody. Thank you, Palab. Um, very briefly, I'm working with Dave Hondula at Arizona State University, Val Valerie Marlowe at the Disaster Research Center at Delaware, Nicole Eret at, uh, at the University of Washington, and Nathaniel Rosenheim at Texas A&M University. And we've formed the Data Publication and Research and Instrument Sharing Group. And that's in response to the Converge facility has been working with the Rapid facility at Washington and the NSF funded Design Safe facility at the University of Texas Austin on a social science and interdisciplinary data model where we can all now publish our de-identified data as well as our data collection protocols and our instruments. And we can actually get a permanent digital object identifier or DOI through this data publication process. And so this group will not be funded because I'm involved in it, but this, we will have a data publication and research and instrument sharing group to try to help all of these groups to ensure that they get those permanent digital object identifiers for the various instruments that you are creating, the protocols that you're developing, and the data that you are collecting. So more soon, and there's lots up on the Converge website about this. Thank you. Next, we are going to hear from Lu Chunlin in uh, Singapore. Lu, are you on the call out there? Oh, sorry. Oh, here we go. Okay. Hi. Hello, Professor Rory. Hello, everyone. I'm Serena, assistant for Dr. Liu from the KNC Protective uh, Singapore. Okay, our working group title is to introduce one methodology research on advanced integrated security system. It aims to link numbers of complex security systems such as the access control favor screen systems in order to mitigate the, the possible stress and risk for the healthcare facilities. Okay, the implementation Implementation of these methods on healthcare facilities is also suitable for other infrastructure, such as school, institute, hotel, hospital. 
Okay, so uh, due to the current uh, outbreak of the COVID-19, infectious diseases of protection, infectious patients are now being managed with the high risk vigilance, deploying mass bevel screen systems, providing the negative pressure rooms at the nearby accessible healthcare facilities, normal waste, waste disposal to complex environment drainage system should take into consideration with the optimized hygiene at every aspect of the uh, drainage process. So uh, advanced integrated security systems will be an effective control and coordination systems. It will consolidate the relevant activi activities advanced into one management console for better uh, event management while securing all endpoints. So now new technologies such as the security robots, facial recognition with AI also uh, uh, can be explored. So by carefully selected and properly applied electronic security technology, we'll be able to reduce the risk and the safeguarding healthcare facilities. Uh, so this uh, methodology research are welcome to uh, looking forward to the participation of the specialists and professors. So uh, thank you everyone. Thank you, Serena, for joining us and for representing. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we're transitioning now. So next up, we're going to hear from Jeff Carney. Hi, Laurie and everyone. Um, so I've been working on putting together a, uh, a network called Aligning Community Action, Bridging Needs and Research Through Co-Design with uh, Ann Yoakum at the uh, Small Center for Collaborative Design Tulane. Uh, I'm at the University of Florida. Um, we are actively recruiting very new um, uh, group information. Um, this research network will advance co-design methodologies that align near-term community needs with long-term adaptation to address community challenges primarily related to community health and well-being uh, that will come up following and potentially still during the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, the gap between community action and scientific consensus is often widening. Um, suggesting a fundamental lack of trust that risks undermining coordinated short and long-term efforts towards adaptation, not only to uh, public health concerns from COVID, but also climate change and other uh, large-scale risks. Our network participants operate primarily in community design centers and engage with researchers from health, social science, biophysical sciences, engineering fields. Uh, we are interested in how design as a method of action uh, action research is an effective way to lead change, but also as a way to activate the research of others. We are looking for others working in this space as designers, planners, healthcare researchers, social scientists, uh, really it's a totally open um, group. Um, we were interested in furthering the method, especially in this time of crisis, uh, both in terms of what we design and, and how the physical de design of the environment follows this crisis, but also uh, how we engage literally uh, in the time where we are socially distant, how do we conduct design um, processes in the future? Um, thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Next, we're gonna hear from Louise Comfort who may have the record of she has people in 16 different time zones affiliated with her group. So Louise, over to you. Louise. Am I? Oh, there we go. There Got it. Go. Okay, sorry. Uh, we've organized a global researchers network for COVID-19 that focuses on understanding dynamic mechanisms that have generated a global pandemic across communities, organizations, jurisdictions, sectors, and nations. We seek to identify factors that build collective cognition of risk, enabling coordinated action, to bring this pandemic under control and factors that inhibit coordinated action. Our working group includes researchers from nine countries, China, Korea, Japan, Italy, Germany, Ireland, Turkey, Canada, and the US, and two doctoral students who are working with their mentors. We aim to develop a rigorous, disciplined approach to address large-scale, complex, interdisciplinary, 
dynamic problems that elude current methods of research analysis and policy making. We seek to apply a framework of complex adaptive systems of systems to capture the interdependent sequences of decisions that lead to cascading consequences. We recognize that innovative methods of data collection, analysis, comparative research, and data exchange are essential to address these massively complex problems. Our goal is to model the emergence of collective cognition of risk across communities and the transition to collective action to reduce risk on a global scale. Thank you, Louise. Uh, Samantha. Hi, everyone. Um, so we have a very recently formed group that is very much open. We would love for you to come join us. Um, we are really looking to focus in on the capacity of local emergency management agencies across the United States. Specifically, we are interested in looking at emergency, agents, uh, emergency management agencies that are perhaps under-resourced, uh, specifically related to concerns with understaffing, uh, the amount of time they have, issues of funding, uh, and kind of how that is all coming to fruition in the midst of COVID-19 as everyone's kind of responding at once. Um, as we're, you know, seeing this additional strain on these agencies, we're um, also kind of thinking about some of these other more unique factors like the length of the actual response of this event, uh, the potential lack of mutual aid across jurisdictions, the possibility of other disasters that may occur, which a few other groups have mentioned, um, and then also just the kind of added complexities of physical distancing on the work that these agencies are doing. Uh, so we're looking to survey local emergency management agencies across the country to kind of assess the strain that they're going uh, through right now. Uh, but we also want to be thinking forward about how this survey could be repeated in the future, particularly related to strain in the context of the climate crisis, and then also uh, thinking ahead about how this uh, data could be pushed into policy making decisions as well. Uh, so currently it's myself and Amanda Savitt who is a doctoral student at North Dakota State University. Um, we're definitely looking for some more people to join. So if you are interested, we're very much open to ideas. Um, just reach out and let me know. Thank you, Samantha. And next we're gonna hear from Brian Houston. Uh, thanks, Lori. Um, yeah, our working group is focused on COVID-19 communication ecologies, and our group is actually uh, the opposite of formed and closed. We are in formation and actively recruiting members. So if anyone's at all interested, please let me know. I was very late getting my information into Lori, so I, this, is, this is my fault. So. Brian, that was my fault. I'm sorry I didn't update <laughs> that. I, I'm sorry. No, really. I sent my stuff like 10 minutes before the meeting and Lori still got it in. So thanks, Lori. Um, anyway, so Communication Ecologies is taking a broad view of communication and information resources within the context of the COVID-19 outbreak. We're going to be looking in this working group at the connections and interactions of interpersonal, organizational, and mediated communication and information resources. So this isn't going to be necessarily focused on like discrete messages and message strategies but kind of the broad ecology of communication and information. And what we're interested in then is the way that those communication information resources are connected and then related to a variety of outcomes. So outcomes we're gonna be interested in are things like risk perceptions and protective behaviors, physical and mental health and functioning, social connections and other things. Um, this will be a very diverse group using different methods of investigation, for example, surveys, social media data analysis, GIS, network analyses, these sorts of things. Um, we already have representatives from public health, social work, communication, engineering, but this is definitely a group where the more the merrier. Um, I think some of the scope of the working group will definitely be looking at comparing different communities and groups in terms of what these communication ecologies look like related to various outcomes. And the last thing I'll say is that ultimately the point of this working group is to understand what communication and information resources 
help individuals, families, schools, and communities cope with uh, this event. And then we can sort of apply that insight into future events as well. So thanks. Thank you, Brian. And then the last, but certainly not least in this grouping is Liesl Ritchie with research on research. Can you hear me okay? Yes, yeah, sound perfect. Okay, great, thanks so much for this opportunity to introduce the Research on Research or ROAR working group. I'm collaborating with Elena Sutley at University of Canvas on this effort. I'm currently at Oklahoma State University and soon to be at Virginia Tech. Uh, the purpose of ROAR is to systematically document the activities and experiences of researchers in public health, social science, and other fields, including engineering, who are examining social dimensions of COVID-19. In the short term, this will afford us an opportunity to keep members of the research community up to date regarding what's unfolding. In the longer term, the information we collect has the potential to help prepare researchers in the future for what to expect when events arise. This will be accomplished by conducting a qualitative study that addresses the following three objectives. One, to illuminate how COVID-19 researchers are drawing upon existing theoretical frameworks and concepts as they navigate this new territory. To determine ways in which the current and ongoing situation is influencing researchers thinking about disaster research. And three, to learn about how the COVID-19 pandemic is affecting researchers, both professionally and personally. Our methodological approach will involve semi-structured interviews with a purposive sample of researchers. We have IRB approval and anticipate interviews to begin in late May or early June and to continue throughout the summer. After the initial interview, we plan on following up with researchers at about a three month interval after that and plan to extend our research over a couple of years uh, after the initiation. So that is where we are. It sounds like we need to reach out and talk with Jack at York University on the doing of research. There are some similarities, I think, and we'll look forward to speaking with some of you in the future, we hope. Thank you, Liesl. And thank you everyone in the methodological, empirical and networks group. And so now we're gonna move on to our third and final grouping of proposed working groups. And this one focuses on specific uh, often potentially vulnerable population groups in the context of COVID-19, as well as other disasters and also social institutions. And uh, I am watching the clock. We have about 19 minutes remaining. We have seven additional uh, working groups that are gonna be uh, featured here. And so Jane uh, is gonna lead us off in this section of proposed working groups. So Jane, over to you. Thanks, Laurie, and thanks all of you at, Co at the Converge Group again. Um, I really appreciate it. So as um, Jack Wazdilski mentioned earlier, I am an independent researcher. Um, currently, I'm on contract with World Bank Haiti right now, and I'm affiliated as a professorial lecturer with um, George Washington University. So um, first, I just want to say that um, you, many of you might know that there already exist multiple gender working groups going on uh, globally right now in response to COVID-19, which is great. I, this group, um, I see maybe we can pull some things together, but one of the things I also see is maybe we can fill some gaps that, or, or help prevent gaps from forming. How's that? So um, this group is wide open. Um, and please let me know if you're interested in joining. What's going on with this is that, so um, one of the things that happened is when the sheltering in place, when the quarantines um, were launched in so suddenly in so many different parts of the world, as well as gradually elsewhere, along with the cutting off of access to food and other resources, including as well as jobs, um, we knew a lot of, you know, the practitioners, humanitarian response, as well as social scientists knew that it was likely that gender-based violence would increase and reports show that it has. So a lot of the initial response by groups has been in reaction to that concern. But one of the things, again, speaking in terms of gaps or, or things we don't want to happen is that gender and intersectionality isn't just about women and it's certainly not about women just as victims or as relatively more vulnerable. So what we're also seeing that's happening 
immediately um, with those concerned with gender and sex um, in the medical profession is this examination of the relatively higher rates of men's mortality that is going on. And they're, they're looking at both sex and gender characteristics and seeing that there seems to be a mixture. But one thing we aren't really yet getting or, or able to figure out, because all of this, of course, is happening so quickly, is what are some of the differences in terms of national origin or ethnicity or income level and access to health coverage and care? So again, it's not so much that things aren't already occurring, it's that, and I don't want to be redundant, certainly, but maybe we can help navigate and make sure that we see the intersectional aspects and keep encouraging um, people to keep moving along these continuum and not, and not leave gaps. Finally, one of the other things that we know, and several of the speakers so far have been talking about these multiple disasters that we can anticipate or that have already happened, for example, in Puerto Rico with the earthquakes and the upcoming hurricane season. So I, for example, some of the people that I'm working with in our current research are looking at gender-based violence in those contexts. So, so people of different genders with these compounded these compounded events and within this larger catastrophe, how, how are things happening there? Are they fitting with older patterns that we did predict and are occurring? Or is something new going to be taking place and are new adaptions possible? Then another aspect that um, just where so many things are happening at once, food security was discussed by the first group. Another one of our, our teams are looking at um, research and farming regionally, as well as food security. And then another group are looking at migration issues and, and refugee issues, but also the migrants. Um, I'm sure this is in different places happening at the same time, but as the season, season shifts, seasonal migration is still happening. So a lot of people are without homes, without shelter, and with all of the concomitant issues going on. Again, these are, these are not unique to women, but they are gendered intersectional issues. And the more that we can explore how this is happening, both within households and without, finally, of course, a lot of talks have been coming out in the, in the popular media since so many OECD nations are being impacted and, and so much hap is happening within the household about gender roles. And maybe going forward, again, gender roles, intersectional aspects of that by race, sect, language use, migration status, citizenship status, disability status. There's so, there so many ways that we can be looking at these roles and again, adaptations going forward. The final thing I wanna say is that this is one of the key points that I feel that all of us can be, can be working toward is not just thinking about COVID-19. Yes, I understand that this is about COVID-19 and that we have to, we are, this is what's happening right now. But also think in terms of the long-term, speaking specifically now about gender, whenever we've looked at disasters and their outcomes, we know that a lot of, a lot of the more serious aspects of vulnerability are in the long-term, the aftermath, when many of the humanitarian workers have left, when many of the policies have shifted back to supposedly everything's fine now. Yeah, so, I mean, yeah, thank I, you so much. I, know I really hope we can think about that. Sorry, thank you for cutting me off. <laughs> that, please, no apologies. Thank you so much for that and and thank you for making sure it is information actively recruiting because there are so many issues so thank you and now we're going to turn to laura sal who's going to pick up on that issue of disability laura hello everybody um our working group will be looking at disability and covid um, 19. we currently have um, nine members from five universities um, representing the disciplines of educational psychology, disability studies, special education, education and social work. And so our goal is to examine the intersection of disability and COVID-19 as a natural hazard. Um, we're focusing on how this unfolding emergency is affecting people with disabilities, particularly with respect to access to social services, attendant care, medical care, and community resources. 
Um, we're also interested in if people with disabilities, but without um, underlying health conditions, for example, intellectual disabilities or people with hearing impairments are disproportionately experiencing barriers to information and services in relation to COVID-19. Um, I'll pause here just for a moment. Um, and say that our team this week have been talking a lot about these self-protection measures from CDC and thinking about how some of those measures of self-protection are um, um, not possible for some people with disabilities to um, perform or they need assistance um, to perform something as simple as, you know, covering your, your, your cough or your sneeze. Uh, we have three objective areas as our focus. One, we want to examine um, existing theory. So how does this pandemic expand or change existing con uh, conceptualizations of how disasters intersect with disability status? Um, two, we want to um, delineate what we see as the most important research questions um, with respect to this topic and prioritize future empirical studies. Um, three, we want to um, look at evidence-based practice with uh, respect to supporting both people with disabilities and um, disability um, organizations. And then finally, we want to look at what these unfolding events reveal with respect to the need for policy change um, and policy creation with respect to people with disabilities. Um, we are particularly interested in including another member from the discipline of public health if somebody is interested um, in this, this working group. So please do reach out. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. Jamie? Hi, Lori, and hi, everyone. Uh, for the sake of time, I'll keep this rather brief. Um, I've been discussing plans with a lovely group of colleagues to submit a proposed working group titled Homelessness and COVID-19. We are still in the early stages of formation and are actively recruiting members. Uh, the COVID-19 pandemic has already revealed and is continuing to reveal striking disparities in the ability for certain individuals and groups to respond to the crisis. In particular, among those groups that researchers have identified as being made most socially vulnerable to disasters. Even outside times of disaster, people experiencing homelessness are often without consistent safe shelter, let alone the means to self-isolate or shelter in place as recommended or ordered. There's also the fact that public spaces used by people experiencing homelessness for daily survival have been made inaccessible. Although the precise goals and activities of the group are in development, this group will focus on and discuss the unique issues faced by those experiencing homelessness in light of the COVID-19 pandemic, as well as examples of positive responses and creative coping strategies. Additionally, we will document and discuss the implications of varying government-based responses across scales and contexts as an initial way to capture what's being done or not being done to address the needs of this population. Please be in touch if you're interested in participating in this group. And with that, I'll wrap up. Thank you. Thank you, Jamie. Uh, Marla? Hi, everyone. Um, the Children, Youth, and Schools Working Group is going to focus on research coordination to learn about the impacts of the pandemic and the effectiveness of the response efforts on the rights of children and youth with respect to, first of all, safety, survival, and protection. So that will be um, looking at health, child protection, and psychosocial support, um, hopefully. Um, development, which will focus on educational continuity and particularly looking at differential outcomes of variations in educational policy and educational continuity programming. <clears throat> and thirdly, um, participation, the engagement of children and youth themselves. Um, Cross-cutting issues of inclusion and equity, equity will be included, as will urban impacts. Um, we uh, very much hope that this will be a strong collaboration between um, academic researchers as well as um, practitioners. and. Um, so we are actively um, recruiting and information and seeking a focal point and um, and then you know at the moment um, we don't know who who might have any funding to get started but um, we will we'll aim to communicate and collaborate um, uh, across uh, countries to improve both evidence-based practice as well as practice-based evidence. Thank Thanks. you, thank you, Marla. 
And our last three working group proposals, we're going to hear from, um, at least for today, we hope many more are coming in through the chat box and otherwise. Now we're going to hear from Christine Gibb. Oh, Christine. Hi. Oh, hi. Um, okay, we can hear you. Okay, good. Um, so very briefly, uh, this working group on pandemic immobilities um, we'll look at the experiences of children and seniors during the during the pandemic and specifically look at the social and spatial immob immobilities of these groups and i've um, separated immobilities with a backslash to show how the two concepts are very closely related so the mobilities in this research in this working group will look at both social and spatial and then the, the goal of this research, of, of this working group, um, would be aiming to provide recommendations to governments, uh, public health and school officials, and other stakeholders. So this is responding to some of the comments that Ben Wisner had earlier in the chat box about what are some of the operational products or practically useful inputs or interventions of these different working groups. So one of the goals of this working group would be to look at some of the deliverables of where research on seniors and children can be most usefully placed, whether it's in the hands of school boards or nursing homes, policy makers, um, teacher training, that sort of thing. Looking at the different media that might be most appropriate for reaching out to these groups, whether it's a policy brief, um, whether it's an online video or an interactive map, um, research papers, um, and another goal of this working group would to be to look at some of the different methodologies that we're using to work with these groups, um, including looking at some real time methodologies and some of the ethical implications of uh, working with uh, these populations during the pandemic and when particular uh, groups may be experiencing quite um, a strong emotional uh, and mental health responses. Um, so I'm actively recruiting at this point uh, other collaborators in various fields, um, particularly if someone um, has experience with social isolation, with um, children and technologies, uh, with uh, seniors with people's understandings of finances, um, so in all sorts of fields. Thank you, Christine. And I just want to end this uh, working group will also focus on gender analysis as well. Good, thank you. Uh, next, Heather Lazarus and Julie Maldonado. Great, thanks. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, my co-lead, Julie Maldonado, and I am at the National Center for Atmospheric Research. Julie is at the Livelihood Knowledge Exchange Networks, and together we're the co-directors of the Rising Voices Climate Resilience Through Indigenous and Earth Sciences program. And we're proposing a working group that brings together Indigenous and Earth Sciences and practices in response to COVID-19. We will engage a working group of experts, primarily from the Rising Voices uh, community, a network of over 600 Indigenous and Earth scientists, educators, students, uh, managers, community leaders, and organizers. COVID-19 is having really specific and devastating impacts already um, and, and also spurring resilient responses among Indigenous populations specifically. Uh, this is due to their unique histories, cultures, and capacities. The working group will seek broad input um, from the earth science and indigenous communities to compile a list of observations and questions about the impacts and responses to COVID-19 in indigenous communities. And this list will then be curated into convergent research questions spanning both indigenous and earth science knowledge systems and practice systems. The list will, we hope, catalyze research and adaptation communities to drive really urgent culturally appropriate responses to COVID-19. Um, the working group is formed and semi-open in that we're hoping it, that it will be open to the Rising Voices community. And if people are interested in that, please do reach out. Um, yeah, and with that, I'll wrap up. Thank you. Thank you, Heather. And then again, last but certainly not least, Nania Campbell. 
Thank you, Lori. Um, and I'll try to be brief. I know we're, we're getting ready to wrap up. Um, the group I'm proposing is called Social Safety Net Organizations Serving Vulnerable Populations. The group is in formation and actively recruiting members. Um, this proposed working group is focused on uh, community, faith-based, and social service organizations that comprise the social safety net and that routinely serve socially vulnerable populations. Um, so we're seeking to connect researchers who are examining the response among, for example, um, senior centers, food banks, homeless shelters, and others that provide services to groups that lack access to resources and representation and that are most at risk in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, we will be seeking, seeking to understand sort of how these organizations are mobilizing in response to the situation, how they're innovating, what common challenges they're experiencing, and what we can learn from their experiences. Um, so regardless of their individual missions and the populations they specialize in, um, these organizations tend to have many characteristics, and particularly in particular their client populations in, in common. Um, they tend to operate on shoestring budgets, rely heavily on volunteer support, and are often comprised of workforces that are themselves members of the populations who are at greatest risk to this to COVID-19. Um, so because their margins in staffing are thin, they often lack the capacity to be actively involved in FOADs and other disaster preparedness networks and planning processes. Um, they operate often in a near constant state of crisis in a lot of respects, and yet little is known about how they pivot to manage a broader scale emergency like this. So we're really looking to connect with other researchers who have an organizational focus specifically and are particularly con concerned about the population served by this sector. So we want to kind of cross fertilize ideas and break down some of the silos around the populations and really focus on what the commonalities among them. Um, if you're interested in joining, please do get in touch. Thank you. Thank you, Nania. And Everyone on the forum, I, a, a big round of virtual applause to all of the persons who stood up and signed up and, and shared their ideas today. I know we are at time right now, so a few closing announcements and then know that the team here will stay on as long as any of you need if you have questions. A few closing things. The application window for the COVID-19 working groups is April 4th to April 13th. All that is up on the Converge website. We will announce the funding for the working groups by April 17th. And so please put your applications in. If you didn't share today, that means you're, all the application window is open to everybody. We really encourage those who did share to obviously go ahead and apply. Also other ideas that are emerging for all of you, we hope you will apply as well. Uh, we thank again the National Science Foundation for making all of this possible through Converge and we thank the anonymous philanthropic donor for the specific gift that has made the funding of these working groups possible. Um, we also wanted to make sure and again thank all of the presenters, thank the Natural Hazard Center team and the Converge team. If you are on the line, you have an idea for a working group that was not at all shared today, two requests please go ahead, put it up in the chat box so we have a record. And also, if you would email us at converge at colorado.edu, what we're going to do is we'll continue to update this slide deck with additional ideas that have come in as a result of this forum. And then we're going to get these slides posted so that as people are coming to the website and looking for working groups to potentially form or to join, that they can really see all of the ideas that have been generated by this extraordinary community. So again, you're welcome to put the information up in the chat box and we'll follow up if you have other working group ideas or just email us directly at converge at colorado.edu and we'll share this level of information on your working group idea. So one more big round of applause to all of the persons who shared their working group ideas today. This was deeply inspirational and it showed us exactly um, how much work there is to be done around this disaster. And as Jane noted, as many other disasters that have already happened and are yet to come. So thank you for doing all that you're doing. Thank you for being a part of this network and um, thank you for sharing. And so we're gonna sort of there, we're gonna pause from what was sort of the formal program because again, I know we're at time, but again, we'll, the Converge team will stay on here as long as we need if people have additional questions or anything that you want to follow up on. And I know it's late in some parts of the world. And so if you need to sign off, please know that we're wishing you well and hope that you all stay safe. So thank you so much, everyone.
Thank you. Hi, Lori. I do have a couple questions that have come in throughout awesome. the session. If you would like me to go ahead and start awesome. asking those, then you can try to do your best to answer. Yeah, um, one. Awesome. Thank you. Right. The first one from Joan DeRuin um, it said, is there a limit on the number of working groups that a person can join? Great question. And hi, Joe. I hope everything is well in Louisiana. There is no limit to the number of working groups that people are able to join. It's a great question, and there's obviously so many cross-cutting issues here. Um, and again, definitely no limit to the number that you're able to um, able to join. Thank you, Joe. And then we also have one from Dana Green who says that Marcelin and I are wondering what happens when our project fits into more than one working group category. Great question, Dana, and I hope you are doing well in North Carolina. Um, so if a working group fits into multiple categories on the um, on the application form when you go to fill it out you actually should be able to click more than one and so for example if you're looking at both population groups and ethics you can click more than one it's fine if you're moving across issues for today's purposes for the virtual forum I just kind of tried to inductively group these together in some kind of way that would make sense for the presentations but as far as your application um, that's great that they're cross-cutting on these issues and you're welcome to just check that off on the form thank you Dana and then I just have one more that has already been asked from Ben Weiser and it's a multiple part question okay <laughs> um, and so he says I'd like to know from everyone who presented such a wonderful brief summary of their proposed work what operational product or practically useful input or intervention their work would yield so it might be one we want to put on the on the website and people can answer that. And okay. then um, second, he says, as part of the massive change in our whole world that the pandemic may be bringing, hence a catastrophe in the etymological sense of major change, rather than just another disaster, could this work also be a model of bridging the knowledge policy and decision making gap? And then he wants to know if Converge would like to take that on board. <laughs> and people can email him and he offers his thanks. <laughs> oh, ben, thank you so much for being with us. And thank you for both of those questions. And so to your first question about sort of the operational, what, what, what are the operational outcomes of these working groups? And I love that Christine in her, um, in her remarks really started to respond to what you were saying. So our formation of these working groups, we are not putting that requirement at all on the working groups because we want them to be as creative and expansive and um, you know just whatever the working groups end up imagining we really want to leave open that space for uh, transformational thinking and so we're not putting that requirement on the working groups but questions like yours I, I think obviously well we we did hear some of the working groups have various outputs from a book to a, a journal special issue to maybe some of that operational guidance that Chris was referring to and so Ben it is a fantastic Fantastic question. I think you've obviously provoked the working groups to really start thinking about that and um, really appreciate it. And to your second question about Converge really taking that on, I'd say in partnership with you and in partnership with all of us. I mean, this is why this is the power, has always been the power and the strength of this extraordinary social science community. And it's a beautiful question you pose. And as Jen said, I think we're gonna have to figure up out how to get that up on the website as sort of a unifying, a unifying sort of question. So thank you, Ben. And thank you, Jen, so much for reading the questions. Okay, we have um, and one from Joshua Moses who just asked, is it okay to have a non to have non-researchers on the team, for example, faith leaders? Oh, absolutely. And thank you for that question. I think you may have heard Marla Petal, for example, said that's really something that is key to the organization of the children, youth, and schools working group, that they're really trying to encourage those kind of collaborations. I think Jamie with the homelessness group, same with Nania with the social serving organizations group are all thinking about those kinds of collaborations inside the research community, but also far outside of it into many different sectors. So absolutely, absolutely encouraged. Um, and again, we're not putting parameters on these 
working groups. I know they are, they are research working groups at their core, but we're not putting those kind of parameters on the working groups because of we really want you to form the working groups in ways that make the best sense for you and the efforts that you are trying to advance. And so thank you for reaching out across what I know can sometimes feel like gaping divides, but once we reach out, that potential to close it is extraordinary. Thank you. Okay, the next one is from Nicole Savita. She says, are you interested in entertaining proposals from working groups that are moving fast and trying to support responsive policy in the near term with the potential to also do longer range forward looking impact work? Oh, Nicole, absolutely. That sounds Again, that sounds absolutely fantastic. And I know that there are so many questions being posed that social and behavioral scientists, economists, public health researchers are all so posed to answer, but sometimes our research timeline does not align with the needs of policymakers and practitioners who are trying to make life and death, death decisions right now. And so Nicole, absolutely, um, it is a fantastic, question and again sort of there we heard today on the call that some people are planting the seeds for longitudinal working groups some people are doing these sorts of rapid assessments and trying to get the information back out to practitioners and policymakers. and so uh, yes to all of the above and it's a really good question and really good potential for an organizing frame thank you Okay, the next question, I believe you already answered, but um, he po he's posted it again saying it may have gotten buried that working groups seem to be primarily proposed um, and made up of academic researchers and are employees from governmental organizations such as CDC eligible to participate. And this is from Ibuki uh, Kuyonsu. Uh, but beautiful. Yes, absolutely. And I hope you heard that uh, two of the people who presented today were uh, Sarah McBride and Bob DeGroote, who are with our social scientists in the U.S. Geological Survey. And so, yeah, uh, these these are, again, they're research at the core, research working groups, but obviously researchers are not just embedded in academic institutions. We, we've, we researchers from uh, private sector, from nonprofit organizations, and from local state and federal government are absolutely welcome and encouraged to apply. With that said, uh, to your wonderful question, I know that sometimes there are obviously some uh, requirements within various agencies and organizations where, for example, um, an employee of a particular type of organization may not be able to accept uh, some kind of outside grant and so forth. So, of course, it's obviously within the whatever the ethical and organizational requirements are for where you work. But on our side, there are no requirements that these have to be, for example, university based research teams. And again, we did hear from a private sector team today and, a, um, and also a nonprofit organization. And we heard from a government based group. So uh, definitely across the gamut is welcome. Thank you. Okay, then we have a question from the lovely Marla Petal, who says, do we have some ability to reach out globally for more participation from the not so usual suspects? Uh, <laughs> Marla, thank you for asking that. And always thank you for asking who is in the room and who is not in the room. And um, so while we have definitely been trying to our best to this is a, a global disaster that's going to require all of us to respond to it. But you're absolutely right that you know our our networks, uh, our networks are what our networks are, and um, anything that can be done to try to expand those networks. I, I think we already heard some great examples of that today. Louise has a nine country network already going, and so Marla, ab absolutely, I. I um, I think that this is one of the power, powerful uh, potential strengths of these working groups is trying to build those kinds of relationships across geographies, across disciplines, across organizational boundaries and so forth. So again, I know I keep saying no limits, but um, really no limits on that. And thank you, Marla, for raising up that question because this is a reminder for us that oftentimes we do reach back to the people who we know best, but this is an opportunity to try to um, expand out our, our knowledge networks to make them stronger and better. Thank you. So those are all the questions that I have gathered so far. Okay, and I saw, um, I'm gonna have to learn more about this Zoom technology, but I saw Saeed is out there and he raised his hand. And so I don't know, so I, I think at this point too, um, 
if yeah, it, Jen, you are doing fabulously. So if somebody wants, just so it doesn't become chaotic, if you want to just talk, because we can obviously all take ourselves off mute. Um, if you want to maybe put yourself in the chat box, if you would like to say something, which would be fabulous. And then Jen could just call on you. And so I'll maybe start because I did see Saeed use that raise hand feature. So Saeed, if you're still out there, and I'm going to stop this share here so that we can see even more of one another. Um, so, and hi everyone, friends from around the world. It's so good to see you. I'm sorry I can't see you when I'm sharing my screen. Um, so hi. <laughs> so, uh, Saeed, would you like to kick us off if you want to unmute yourself? And then again, if there are people still on the line who would like to um, just unmic and, and talk, please put yourself in the chat box and Jen will call on you. So is Saeed still out there? So Lori, what is the minimum and maximum number of members uh, a group can have? Also um, a good question, but there isn't a minimum or, a, well, I guess there is a minimum. One of the requirements is that the working group members must represent three disciplines. And so between the lead and at least a minimum of two working group members. So there, I guess there's a minimum of three and then the, the maximum is really up to the person uh, who is, who's proposing the working group. Thank you, Kalash. And I saw, I'm seeing hands raising, but again, I'm so sorry, everybody. The Zoom is very hard to navigate when you're the host. And yeah, so Lorian, I don't have access to see the hands raising, so I don't know how to okay. do so, that. Yeah, so if anybody just wants to- I can, uh, can, uh, can I talk about oh, uh, my yes. point? Yes, go ahead, yes. please. Uh, I will try to talk about something. Uh, my language is, yeah, I will try to discuss a point. This point is about uh, the nature of this virus. Uh, I want. To, I didn't want to be in a group because I have uh, difficulty in to follow you. But I want to discuss this point uh, for all. You you may uh, you may find it useful. About uh, this point about the nature of the virus, uh, WHO said that the virus is droplet transmitted. Is droplet transmitted. Uh, the virus transmission. Uh, I think that the virus transmission is uh, is uh, airborne transmission. Uh, the virus in the air. Uh, I make a study to to study this point. Um, I share this uh, point uh, paper. Uh, I find I find that the, uh, there is uh, countries of high transmission rate, and another countries of low transmission rate. Uh, the high transmission rate uh, may uh, show sudden increase in cases. This may indicate two things. The first thing, some countries failed to follow the countermeasures uh, towards the droplet uh, transmitted SARS-CoV-2. This is the first possibility. The second one, the countries, all countries show different susceptibility towards the airborne transmitted SARS-CoV-2. Uh, the matter now about ethnic susceptibility or uh, this ethnic susceptibility, I, write, I wrote a, a paper or a review about it, uh, a previous work in 20, 2017. Uh, but now we must detect one of these uh, possibilities or hypothesis is right. Uh, to do this, to do, uh, this uh, study, I selected uh, a disease which reflects the genetic susceptibility or uh, the immune response in the organ, in the organ, which is lung. This organ is uh, shared in COVID-19 and cancer, uh, lung cancer. Um, so I studied the correlation between cases of COVID-19 uh, COVID and lung cancer incident as a well-known number. What I found that uh, the, COVID, uh, the COVID cases is in the countries moves to uh, in each day moves in each day to be more correlated with the known lung incident. This means that what control the matter is about um, the matter is not about the failed countermeasure, but about our different susceptibility. 
uh, the virus is equally distributed in the air. So some countries uh, show mild symptoms and the other countries show, how, uh, show severe, uh, se severe symptoms. Uh, so we must change our strategy based on this paper or restudy this point uh, by another way or, or, or evaluate this paper. Um, this may change our um, strategies. So I think. Uh, oh. Can you um, do you have the paper that you're referring to and summarizing for us? I I think if you could send that to us at the Converge email, would you be willing to do that? And then I think we could just link that out on the, we okay. can add sort of, a, you know, like a strip in one of the slides with your name and contact information and then link out to that paper. And so that people could make sure and understand sort of the, the complexity of the argument that you're sharing with us. So would that be agreeable? And okay, okay. Thank you. And thank you so much for joining us and thank you for, um, yeah, thank you. And Lori, I, I hope, uh, I hope I can, uh, uh, my uh, my thoughts i can't i can't share my thoughts with you thank you thank i did I, I hope thank you and thank you for sharing that right now in this forum so thank you and uh, jennifer uh yeah I, I figured out the hand raise function and carol garza has her hand raised okay carol go f yeah, yeah, but yeah, please unmute Oh, Carol. Oh, hi. Oh, hi, this is go. Carol. Hi. Hi, this is Carol. Can you all hear me now? Yeah, yes. Hi. Oh, great. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, I am the founder of Harlem Media Insti Institute. It is a intergenerational cultural think tank um, in Harlem, New York. And my objective is to form a group addressing the lack of access to the internet by people of color in marginal communities uh, such as Harlem and urban neighborhoods across the country and addressing cer certain issues or such issues as um, families not being able to communicate the way that we are uh, fortunately able to do today and have access to uh, focus groups to know what is going on. There, uh, concerning COVID-19, there are family members who have um, people who are uh, inmates and because of everything being shut down, the libraries, schools and what have you, Sometimes people use these outlets to be able to communicate with their loved ones who are incarcerated. So I would like to share what I propose to do and to uh, let everyone know who might be interested in joining my group with me. And I have not submitted my abstract as of yet, but I will do so. So thank you so much for um, accepting my um, open invitation. And Carol, thank you. Yet another another dimension of this crisis. And so, if you would, will you please send me a, just to the converge at Colorado.edu? And this is to, that was a great um, summation of your idea for the working group. If you'd send it again, we'll get that up on the slides that we post as additional working group ideas, so people who are interested in those access uh, access issues um, uh, that they can find you, find your email and see sort of your working group title, like what we shared on the slides today. And so if you just want to send that to converge at colorado.edu, again, we'll get those into an updated set of slides so people have the opportunity to see what you're up to and hopefully join this really noble cause. Absolutely. Thank you so very much. Thank you, Carol. You're welcome. And Lori, we have a, a question from Eric Kennedy, who says, how would you like us to handle the evolving membership? For example, better to wait um, to submit until the deadline to get a more final list, or is there a way to update throughout the process, or is it just assumed and acceptable that it will grow post-application? 
Oh, great. Yeah, great question. And actually, you know, that limit question that was asked earlier, I was realizing, I think in the application form, we have the 10 slots and then you can fill in more people. But so Eric, it's a great question. And for everybody out there, just do the best you can with what you have right now, knowing that and hoping that these groups are going to evolve and that they are going to expand over time as people come and they see the working groups up there on the website and are able to join forces with you and hopefully to support your efforts and advance your efforts and so forth. So Eric, great question. I would say, um, you know, if, if you're really, really in transition, you know, you do have an April 4th through April 13th. And so, you know, maybe take advantage of that extra time that you have for getting your application in. But if you feel like your group's pretty robust, you have quite a few members and you're just ready to hit submit on that application, that's fine too. And so um, I hope that helps. I know it's a bit of a wishy-washy answer, but each one of these groups are so different in terms of how formed they actually are at this point. So, um, but again, I, I guess I'd say rather we, we don't really have the capacity to sort of keep combing through lots of different applications. So I guess I'd say if you're really in that deep formation stage, maybe hold off from hitting the submit button until closer to that April 13th deadline so it can be more complete and you don't have to go back and, and try to revise the application. So thanks for asking asking that. But again, we, we totally understand the groups will likely change and grow over time. So thank you. Just want to make sure we aren't inundating you with workload on this. So thanks. Yeah, <laughs> that, that is always a welcome sentence. So thank you for saying that, Eric, and thanks for raising the question. And we'll actually, these questions are great. And we started building out a frequently asked questions portion of the working groups page. So please know everybody, we will definitely honor your questions by getting them up there because if you have it, probably lots of other people do too. So thanks. I don't have anything else coming in right now, Lori, so. Nice. Jennifer, thank you so much. And Katie, thank you so much, everybody who's out there. We had a snowstorm again yesterday in Colorado, and we we're so worried the internet was going to go out. So oh, wait. Sarah Hamaday just raised her hand. <laughs> oh, very nice. Sarah, hi. I hope everything's okay in New York. And do you hi. hi. Do you have a question or comment for the group? Yes, thank you. I will make it very quick. I, I tried to put it in the chat, but my internet was going on and off. I uh, didn't realize that we had a thousand dollars budget um, for these working groups. And I'm wondering, is there any other any types of restrictions or maybe suggestions from you in terms of uh, what would you want for us to spend uh, that thousand dollars on for these working groups? Uh, great question, Sarah. And that is right. The, the working groups there, they'll be awarded a thousand dollars and that will just be um, we hope just sent directly to the lead and then to be used on any research related expenses. And so again, it's, it really is up to the working group lead to go ahead and define that in, in collaboration with the working group members, of course. Um, but we have a few sample ideas up there on the website, which again, I say are meant to be illustrative, but definitely not restrictive because we want the working groups to let their, you know, to, to use their imagination and to use the funding in ways that will best support their vision for what the working group is going to do. Um, but since you asked for some specific examples, I mean, some of the things we have up there are um, paying for technology, helping to fund undergraduate or graduate research assistants, helping with transcription uh, expenses, uh, you know, just so again, sort of broadly defined any kind of research related expenses that your working group might incur and any sorts of expenses that they, um, or any kind of expenditures that you might want to make to try to help to amplify your efforts. Um, I know, for example, Louise Comfort already, she had said in her description, she they were going to use it to fund an undergraduate student to help to take notes during the working group meetings 
sessions and to be really more integrated into the working group activities. And so, Sarah, there really aren't clear parameters around that. Again, we give some examples on the application form online, but it really is just any quote unquote research related expenses. And there aren't reporting requirements around that, nor is there indirect expenses that are charged and so forth. So uh, I hope that helps Sarah and really wonderful question. Thank you. This was very helpful. Thanks. Thank you. Does anybody else out there have any questions or comments? Anything you want to say or share with the, the last people standing here? Thank you, Laurie, for all you do. I've got to get to kids who've been patiently waiting, but thank you so much. Oh my gosh, thank you. And I'm so glad that the, the boys made it through and, and thank you so much for uh, sharing today and being here with us. Have, a, have a great six night. hours of video meetings today. Like they get all the peaches and fruit cocktail that they want. <laughs> oh, <laughs> well tell the boys hello and I hope you're staying safe and, and have a good evening. Hey, Lori, can I ask Ben Weisner? He's there sitting for long, so I want to hear something from him. <laughs> so, Ben, can you say something? Uh, I'm very happy to see you here. Oh, Ben, are you still on and out there? Kalash asked if, I don't know, if maybe you want to respond yeah. to your own questions that you raised or... Uh, uh, let me raise my hand. Yeah. Is that ben? ben? Is that you? Sorry, I'm trying. This to... is me. Oh, this very is... nice. So, Kalash, just ask if since you've stayed on here, what do you what do you have to share? Any insights? Oh, well, I mean, first of all, thank you very much, Lori, and, and thanks everybody. This this is an incredible uh, feast of ideas and so much passion and uh, and also um, everyone was was so so concise. So, so now I can, um, <laughs> I could be the exception and I can rattle on for, for, for hours and hours. Um, but um, um, I, I um, participated in, or I'm still participating in a, in an, um, a flurry of emails um, that came out today through the um, Gender and Disaster Network. Uh, asking the very simple question, is the pandemic a disaster? And um, there were some very interesting responses and, and I imagine it will continue on. Uh, I suggested, and, that, and also I, was, uh, I think I mentioned this in the second part of my question um, earlier, uh, I suggested that um, this isn't just a disaster. This, and I'm not sure the right word, but maybe the, the word catastrophe is appropriate, both because of the magnitude, and we, and it's, and this is an ongoing, open-ended um, um, uh, series of stresses that it's putting on societies and economies and individual livelihoods, on on relationships, on family structures. Uh, and all of these issues have been touched on one way or another or earlier by people. And, and so just in terms of magnitude, but also in terms of the notion that's, in, that's, that, that's there etymologically in, in the word catastrophe, the, the Greek origin is really r refers one to change and to, uh, and, and to, sudden serious very you know, massive change and so uh i, I think uh a, 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 someone actually I, I can't remember who had this in the uh in the in the chat box so it'll be recorded uh, she also was was wondering whether or not societies will actually return to the status quo ante in all respects. I mean, in some respects, of course, they, they will. Uh, in other respects, will there be some serious change? And um, just for instance, um, the, the, the massive economic uh, support uh, programs that have been legislated in, in many countries 
uh, including the US, uh, actually, will they help to legitimize the notion of a universal minimum income? Uh, at the moment in the United States and in many parts of the world, that notion is, is from cloud cuckoo land. People don't take it seriously. They think it's a bizarre, strange communist idea. I mean, uh, beyond, beyond communist, it's nuts. It's from another galaxy. Well, maybe, maybe, maybe not. Uh, anyway, that's one thing I have to say. The other thing is that I have been really saddened to, to read so much recently, uh, both in London where I was until six days ago, seven days ago, uh, and, and here, uh, and find that in the, uh, in the news coverage, in the, in, in the uh, scientific publications that I monitor, uh, uh, in the Lancet and so on and so forth, there's almost nothing about climate change at the moment. Everyone is focused on this big event in the world, which of course is ex extremely important, right? Uh, uh, and, and I think that um, there needs to be, uh, and maybe some of the working groups will, will, um, will take this up. Maybe this needs to be a separate, <laughs> working group in the in in, in the third group of, of the third uh, 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 grouping that you that you that you produced um, inductively uh, on the question of 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 distraction and 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 focus and and when the the connections the interconnection between this particular event and these other existential risks, which the center Cambridge, the center, the Cambridge Center for Existential Risk, uh, is is constantly working on, and their whole series. I recommend the 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 the, uh, the website and interaction with them. Uh, it's a center that was started by Stephen Hawken and by uh, Martin Rees, the uh, former uh, astronomer royal, and they have a whole series of wonderful young scholars and scholars in residence working there on what they consider to be existential risks. And I think that as we look and think about um, um, this, this event, the COVID-19 pandemic, we, we, we need to see it in the context of these other major existential risks. And in fact, within the context of the geopolitical situation, um, economic globalization, fragmentation, you know, growing, uh, growing nationalism, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, we, we have to keep that broader perspective as well as zero in on the things that can really help policymakers and decision makers and ordinary people right now. I mean, so that we have to balance those two because it sounds like I'm talking out of, out of two sides of my mouth. On the one hand, I want the big picture. On the other hand, I'm, I'm urging people to be very practical. Well, I think we have to be, do both. So that, that, that now I've, I've totally blown it. I have not been concise, but uh, thank you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Kalash, for uh, <laughs> inviting me to speak. The only other thing I want to say is to praise uh, a government institution in the United States, which for some of you who know me uh, will realize that this is an unusual thing for me to say. Uh, my partner Sony and I landed in Atlanta uh, on Delta Airlines coming from London seven days ago. CDC came on board gave us all questionnaires, took some temperatures, and we thought, yeah, this is, nothing's gonna come of this. Well, I'll be darned. Three days later, they had sent our particulars, including our seat numbers and so forth, all our contacts to the uh, health department in the state of Ohio. And the health department in Ohio that is just run by an absolutely brilliant, brilliant, uh, a consummate professional, uh, Dr. Amy Atkin, had sent it to our local county health 
uh, office, one of, the, one of the 113 health districts in Ohio, and we got a call from a public health nurse. And they're calling us every day. They're monitoring our body temperature. They are, you know, we're in quarantine for 14 days, right? And we thought, ah, oh, this is pretty Mickey Mouse, really. It wasn't. It was really, it really works. And I'm so impressed. I'm really, I must say, something works. <laughs> I'd like to make a quick comment, if that's okay. This is Joki Marumba. Oh, hi. thank you, Ben. And hi, Joki. Hi, Dr. Weisner. Uh, good to hear from you. And you brought up to mind something that I have also been thinking about when, whenever you talked about the existential threats. Something else, when you mentioned climate change, I also thought about something that is actually going to be yet another point of... Um, of, of interest, which is the antibiotic immunity that, mm -hmm. um, and, and the lack of a capacity for antibiotics to treat us. And that combined with the current pandemic and, 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 and the surge in uh, especially people who do not have robust healthcare systems to go buy their own medications through the black market or directly is also going to be something that absolutely um, uh, puts fire into, in, in, into the process of uh, this antibiotic um, uh, immunity or lack mm -hmm. thereof and, and the increased use of higher level antibiotics in, in, in treatments in the future. So that's something that is not, be, I, I don't know that is being measured or not measured, but I really do hope it's being measured somewhere. So just thank you for bringing that up. Thank you and thank you for Joki, your work. Joki, could I also just add that I think there'll be a tremendous increase in the, um, in the production and sale of counterfeit uh, antibiotics uh, in many countries in the world. And unfortunately, uh, this includes many African countries, uh, uh, unscrupulous uh, criminals produce and, and market things yes. that are called, um, you know, anti-malarials are called antibiotics, yes, yes. They're, but they're not. I, I... Uh -huh. you know, uh, so, and this, this is also an enormous problem. Yes, sir. I, I, I am from an African country. I am from Kenya. I, and, and that is why I am sensitive to that. And I do thank you very much for bringing that to the attention of the group. Lori, this was great. Thank you. Very informative. Asante sana. Asante sana kwa... Oh, uh, my gosh! Kwa le, kwa le oh, nashukuru! Yeah. Asante sana. Nashukuru. Huh. Mungu abuika ibiriki. <laughs> Na mungu akubariki pia. Asante. Baraka. Uh -huh. Oh my word. Where did you learn Swahili, if I may ask? In Tanzania. Oh, wow. Wow. I, 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 I refused to fight in the Vietnam War. And, uh, and I instead, I, had, I did alternative to military service, which was to live in a Tanzanian... Uh, cooperative village, uh, what uh, the founding president called Ujama. an Ujama yes, village. Yes. I lived there from 1966 to 68. Oh, I can't believe it. Yeah. Amazing. Thank you, Kailash, for asking. Oh. Ben to talk. <laughs> Lovely to meet you. Lovely to oh, meet you. Oh, it's we'll, a delight. We'll, we'll, Asante sana. Yeah. Send, send, me, send, me, send me an email. I will do huh? that, sir. I will do that. Jokey and Ben, I think that exchange was maybe the most beautiful oh, thing I've that heard. That just blows my mind. I feel like I'm and sick. Jokey, this, we're still recording this forum, and so we're going to have to send you that little snippet. That was really, really beautiful. I will, I will treasure that forever. And Jokey, thank you for the additions on top of what Ben said. Kalash, thank you for asking the question, and Ben, Thank you for those, um, just the, the major insights you just shared and um, really, really important. I, I will tell you onto your point about the ex existential threats. Yesterday I was talking to a group of journalists and several, they are all environmental journalists and several of them were saying that, you know, they have these long-term projects on climate change, water security issues, other major, major issues in the world. And, and many of their stories have been as they would say, killed, because, you know, right now, all the news cycle is, of course, about the pandemic. And so I think sort of 
what you were saying about that, that just the, the immediacy of this crisis, this catastrophe that's unfolding, but also how do we as a community, as our social science community, how do we keep our, our eyes on these various um, different disasters, crises, catastrophes yet to come and that are already unfolding that so many on this call are studying. And so Ben, just all of your points have been really well taken. And um, I think it's, it's sort of a charge to the, the working groups as we move forward. So thank you again for being with us. And I hope you and your and Sonia are safe after the trip to London and are, are able to um, be at home. So thank you. So does anyone else, I know several are on there, but people may have had to go on to other things in life. And I know it's starting to, the day is starting to go on. And so does anybody else have any closing, just questions, comments, things you wanna share with the, the, the group before we, we go onwards and I hope upwards. Okay. Yeah. Thanks for everything. Yeah. Thank yeah. you, Dana. Yeah, in India, it is a quarter to five my time to get up after sleep. So <laughs> I didn't sleep. <laughs> uh, anyway, good morning to everybody and uh, or good evening or good night or whatever it is. <laughs> well, Kalash, thank you again for getting up so early with us. Thank you. Mm. Oh, okay, friends near and far and around the world, I think we'll go ahead and um, shut this down then. But again, you can always, if you want us to update the slides with any of your information, your ideas that you want to get out to people, we will definitely do that. So just email us and know how grateful we all are and that we hope you're all staying safe and um, and just what a what a gift it is to be with all of you. And Jennifer and I were talking about what a privilege it is to be in, encircled in this community of scholars who care so much and do so much. So with that, thank you for everything. And um, please uh, be safe, everyone, and, and take care of yourself and take care of others. And, and we'll look forward to seeing you soon. So thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye.